And I and none of that is on the record, which is great. So now Pete's going to be on the record once we get the presentation. What do you mean? Okay. Which is the microphone? You can either use this one or if you want, you can go to that that screen and just touch it. This, this protects me. From okay, so we can go ahead. All right. Um, can everyone hear me online? Oh, you project to the back of the room. Oh, there's no. Okay. It might just be my the online folks. Yeah. I'm Pete DiCarlo. I am um, one of the air quality theme leads for the BSEC project. And alphabetically, I have the dubious honor of being first. Um, so I will give you kind of an overview of what we are thinking about in terms of the science uh, for air quality uh, from a measurement and a modeling perspective. There we go. Um, we kind of were asked to put things in this framework. So just to kind of give you an overview of what we're doing within the air quality theme, uh, there's air quality measurements and air quality models. There is currently uh, an existing low cost sensor network in Baltimore. This has been run by an EPA project for several years. It's been operational since about 2020. Uh, and that will continue to operate through the BSEC project. So we have a good amount of data from this. Uh, this has been operated by Kirsten Kohler, a colleague at, at Hopkins. Uh, for this time, and she'll continue to, to operate that. We are also planning new investments in what we would call an air quality measurement super site. Uh, and the idea for this site is that we will be able to do more detailed measurements. These aren't low-cost sensors. These are research-grade instruments that do very detailed chemical characterization of gases in the air and particles and the composition of those particles. And that information helps us understand what the sources of the air pollution are. Um, in Baltimore. And so that's going to be a targeted site where we plan to do indoor and outdoor measurements to understand how when outdoor air pollution moves to the indoors, what can happen to it? It's cold outside, warm inside, you get some changes in that composition. We can measure that and understand what that might mean for exposure. We will also plan to do targeted mobile measurements. So drive around in a, I think, Amazon delivery van kind of vehicle with instrumentation in that van and make measurements uh, during opportune times. It's not going to be a consistent thing, uh, but it's something that we can do with the instrumentation that we have and the resources that we have. Uh, and that's something that we'd love to talk to the community more about. In addition to the measurements, we're also very interested in, in modeling. How well do we model air quality in Baltimore? Spatially, um, do the models truly represent what's out in that air? Uh, and, and so this is a, a test comparing measurements and models. Uh, and on top of the outdoor air quality, we, we also just like we're measuring indoor air quality, we wanna be able to model what happens when that outdoor air quality comes into an indoor space. And so that's another piece. And we can try to think about what that might mean across different types of houses, different ways that people heat or cool their homes, residential buildings versus um, uh, mechanically ventilated buildings like this one and new builds versus old builds. And we can try to model these different environments to understand um, exposure across the city of Baltimore and in different communities. The guiding kind of overall questions for the air quality theme, um, these help us think about the science that we can do, and certainly we're open to suggestions and, and additional questions to ask, uh, but what actions current and future can be taken to reduce human exposure to hazardous air pollution, both indoors and outdoors? And I think got into that a little bit with the management model discussion that we just had. Thinking to the future, how will climate change and the expect ex expectations of a changing climate modify air pollution exposure in the future and what actions can be made either now or in the future to reduce that exposure. And this is just kind of like a, a graphic to help visualize what we're, we're trying to do and the, some of the co-design that we're hoping to incorporate with community discussions. The basic science questions, now we're going beyond those overall guiding questions into kind of the basic science. Things like what are the spatial and temporal variability and air quality across the Baltimore urban area? Essentially, how does air pollution vary across the city in space and in time, across seasons, across time of day? We want to understand that and be able to think what that may mean for exposure and where people are and how to minimize that. How do homes and buildings modify that exposure to outdoor air pollutants? What can we do? Um, opening windows lets in more outdoor air, closing windows if you can, lets in less. 
there's other things that we can do and other things that we can think about. So we want to think about the built environment and that modulation of, of exposure to outdoor air pollutants. We also really want to understand what the current contributions are from a measurement perspective to air quality. And we can do that with the air quality super site and the very detailed chemical measurements that we make there. Those kind of give us a fingerprint of the various sources of air pollution, whether it's from traffic or industrial emissions or regional or cooking emissions. We can chemically separate those out and, and understand what the relative impacts of those various things are uh, to our exposure. And finally, how could air quality modeling strategies best provide local precise exposure estimates for outdoor and indoor exposure? This is really pushing models beyond what they're regional air quality are trying to do, but we really want to try to drill down into much more localized estimates of exposure. We've got the measurements across the city. We want to be able to also try to model those and see how well we can do that. So what has been done? As I mentioned before, the low cost uh, sensor network is already in place. Um, this is the search network that um, you can kind of see in these, the mouse works. The, you can see all the various nodes that are there up throughout the city. Um, and so this is continuing to operate. Um, previous work that, that we've done in collaboration with others has shown how the chemistry of particulate matter, for example, changes as it gets transported into an indoor environment. And so we want to do that again now for Baltimore and understand what those various sources are. That's what those pie charts are representing. Um, some modeling work has already been done by Wei Peng and her uh, postdoc looking at um, Particulate matter and ozone, two of the kind of key air pollutants that we often think about as, as causing bad air quality, um, what the 2017 area looked like, and then thinking to the future, 2050 under different development scenarios, what we would expect in terms of change in ozone or particulate matter concentrations. So we're starting to think about future climate scenarios and, and what may change based on decisions that we make. Um, and it, it, again, refining our indoor air quality models using Baltimore measurement data to test those models and really refine our understanding of how air pollution when it comes indoors changes and what that means for exposure. Um, so our plans for the coming year, this is my final slide. Preparations for the Courage activities. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. This is a, a even larger investment by the Department of Energy to make more measurements in the region. Um, so not just in Baltimore, but, but more broadly to understand not just Baltimore, but the, the larger region. And, and there's gonna be a lot of measurements that are gonna occur during this kind of intensive period between de December, 2024 and November, 2025. And this is gonna be a key um, time frame to have all of our measurements going and, and going very well. Um, we're looking to develop from the air quality measurement perspective, the super site that I've been discussing and, and start to install the instrumentation that has been ordered uh, and start to do mobile measurements around Baltimore to see what we see with, with that. Um, piece. And then the, finally, the air quality modeling. Um, initiate kind of more regular modeling of the air quality within Baltimore. Start doing the comparisons with the measurements that we'll be doing and, and thinking about simulations for future conditions and couple the indoor air quality model with the outdoor air quality model so that we can run those um, simultaneously. Seeing as this is the first one, I'm not exactly sure. Are we doing questions now or later? We need to have Darren come down to answer science, and then we'll get questions on the two way after that. Perfect. Right. So I'll hang out down here. Gotta find Darren's. Is that folder? I can go in here. So I'm missing. I'm searching. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you guys run. Oh, hi, I'm uh, Darren Worf, Johns Hopkins. I'm one of the, the co-leads for the atmospheric dynamics theme. Um, and so I'm just going to run through a lot parallels what Pete just talked about. By atmospheric dynamics, we're focusing on understanding the kind of weather conditions within Baltimore. So the temperature, the humidity, rainfall, how much mixing there is in the atmosphere, et cetera. Um, and so the key kind of overall driving kind of questions is to be able to understand and model these atmospheric conditions and how they change both with the changing climate and how they're also impacted by characteristics of the urban environment, the landform, the greening, et cetera. 
And so understanding and being able to model these variations is critical for coming up with kind of solutions for mitigation of urban heat, flooding, and air quality. And so some of this, the understanding the mixing of air couples into the air quality. Top left, top left, that way. Okay. Um, well, now I've got to get this to move forward. There we go. Uh, so the, the kind of overall kind of translational research questions that the atmospheric dynamics team is trying to go after, uh, what are the actions, both current and future, can we take to reduce kind of heat exposure or hospitalization or uh, mortality within Baltimore? And we're wanting to do that with a focus on the kind of the neighborhood variations within the city. And if there's a difference between different neighborhoods that have different vulnerability. Um, and then the second is a very similar kind of question, but now asking about extreme precipitation and how that leads to flooding. So our overall kind of goal is to be able to understand and model the controls on heat, precipitation and flooding, and then how we could modify that. And so what are these possible actions that we could take? Uh, the basic science that we're trying to do to, to do that is understanding the changes in this urban environment. By well, urban environment, I'm meaning the urban kind of landform, the green space, et cetera, and understanding how if we change that, how has it changed the urban weather, precipitation, heat, et cetera, as well as the mixing of pollutants, and understand the impact of that at a large range of scales. So I guess a key focus here is not just understanding the city versus the surroundings, it's involved with within the city variations. And so understanding the temporal and spatial variations. And so that's the first kind of question is understanding the control of the land, the urban landform. The second is how that will modify with climate. So as climate changes, what's the impact of those changes going to be on the weather and uh, precipitation mixing within the cities. So what have we been doing? So again, like the air quality, this is a combination of doing a, making measurements and doing modeling, and we're kind of doing both of them kind of simultaneously. The, the observations, we're taking measurements to understand what's happening in the current day and also to evaluate our models, and then the modeling will be used to look for the future. So um, this summer, we've deployed around 20 surface weather stations. So, and this has been a lot of help with the community in terms of locating these. So these are devices that measure the surface, rainfall, temperature, precipitation. Uh, we also have a series of instruments that will measure the kind of atmospheric profile. There's a, a LIDAR or a laser, which has been um, actually installed on Morgan State just this week. It's nearly kind of operational. So hopefully in a month or so after some testing, it will be working. We have the sites for two instruments on communication towers, which are gonna make measurements up and down at different heights to measure the vertical transport of heat, carbon and uh, moisture. So those sites have been located. One of them's in Broadway East, one of them's in, I think it's Howard Park in, in West Baltimore. Um, so that's, just going through the process of legal agreements and SODAR is another instrument which we put down by the uh, inner harbor. And so that site's been found. As well as that, there was, and Pete mentioned Courage, which is this year long campaign that includes Baltimore and the surrounding areas. So that was a successful proposal put by a lot of the BSEC team. And so that's what we're gonna be doing in terms of those observations. And as well as just, making the observations. We've been doing things like mapping the heat across the city. And this information has been passed on to the people who are looking at heat and health relationships. Um, and in terms of the modeling, there's been uh, a preliminary simulation of a year of weather in Baltimore, 2021. We're getting 
very soon to start simulations, but looking out in the future. And then there's going to be simulations of, of different kind of configurations of the model. So we've done the initial kind of run, which is showing the, the variation over the state. And over the next year, we'll be um, implementing different kind of versions of that and doing simulations both for the future and for proposed kind of mitigation strategies. Um, I wasn't. I wanted just to include a little bit of the science from the weather station, seeing as that's what's been preoccupying me. So you can't see this, but these are the measurements in early September when there was a heat wave in Baltimore from this around 20, two types of weather stations that were put out. Um, and the, the point just to highlight here is the lowest temperatures uh, at night are observed in places like Roland Park and the Kerry Murray Nature Center, which is in, in front of a state park. And then the warmest areas are in Arc Church, which is in West Baltimore, uh, sorry, East Baltimore, Allen AME, which is in um, West Baltimore. So it's not an east-west divide. Both of them are equally kind of hot. And Duncan Street Garden, which is in Broadway East. And so this is um, this is information that is not necessarily a surprise, but we didn't have this data. And so it's been vital to be able to go out and put these instruments working with our community partners at these locations. Um, so what's the plans for the next year? Um, we're going to continue putting out more of these weather stations. So we've still got, a, I guess, another 10 that we can put out. Um, the instruments that I've talked about before will all be operational, hopefully in the next three or four months. And we'll be preparing for the kind of courage mission. And as well as putting out more observations, we're now going to have lots of data that we have to kind of analyze and interpret. And at the same time, we're going to be doing these model simulations, both a combination of doing simulations for current day that we're going to use these observations to test. And then we're going to do either future conditions or mitigation scenarios. But before we can start doing future scenarios or mitigation, we have to have some confidence in how good or how poor our model is. And so this data that we've been collecting is going to be vital for evaluating these models. I think that was it. Thanks. Now we have a few minutes of questions for either Pete or Darren or another uh, to answer that. What's a super site? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> the question. Oh, the question is, what is a super site? I'll let Pete tell you. So it's it's just a, a heavily instrumented site. So there's a lot of instruments that are going to be there measuring a whole host of different things and goes well beyond what you'd expect from a, like an EPA regulatory monitoring site. We're going to be doing much more detailed measurements um, and characterization. And the idea is we'd also have additional space for new instruments to come in and be kind of guest instruments. They would, may not be there the whole time, um, but for intensive periods like this Courage project, uh, it would be an opportunity to have um, other guest researchers come in and add more measurements so we have an even better characterization of kind of what's going on in the air. So it's not a super fun site. Correct. It is not a super fun site. It's a super site. So like celebrate it, not run away from it. Yeah. Where are you putting the next 10 weather stations? And you think you're having problems getting access to sites? So the question is, yeah, the question is where we plan to put these next 10 kind of weather stations. And so I don't have a map. So there's a couple of areas where we have kind of gaps that we're wanting to, to fill in. You know, one of them is um, Cherry Hill in South Baltimore. There's an area in West. So there's like two or three areas where... Uh, and we don't have one downtown. Um, and this is this is an area where the community partners are are going to be really vital. So some of the, we're we're still reaching out. And so if you've got some kind of interest, then let us know. I should say that we've got ten more to put out. That probably is not going to be the end of it. So we're just going to keep um, the the two types. One of them was significantly cheaper than the other one. And before we got carried away, we wanted to make sure that the, the cheaper one was going to be making measurements that were, you know, usable. And I think initially we've, 
started to convince herself that that is the case. And so we're hoping we're having these things and we're actually at one stage giving them to community partners to go and put them out on their own would make my life a lot easier. Christian, yeah. I have a quick question for Pete, and I have one, one for each of you. One for Pete is um, a colleague of mine at UBC pointed out to me a few months ago that in Southeast Baltimore, we're in Fort Hill, it's very large, several football field size, and an open pole pond that uh, has dust that can cover, and that apparently there's a gap in the EPA air quality monitoring network so that we don't know much about its impact. Is that a gap that you're going to go? So the, the question was about the Curtis Bay coal pile um, and gaps in regulatory monitoring. And I would, I, I like the EPA, but the, the regulatory monitoring network, there's one site in Baltimore in the city. Um, so I would say there's much more than a single gap. Um, there's a massive hole. And ideally we would be able to cover that. There are some low cost sensors down in that area that can pick up some of the dust that gets blown off of that coal pile. Um, but things like the mobile laboratory that I mentioned um, are ideal for investigating some of those localized sources, determining where, if we do want to put in a more permanent measurement site, we can do that. But the mobile measurements give us an initial survey, and we can build out if we if we think that it makes sense to do so. But yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to fill those those gaps in the in the monetary networks. Uh, my other question, very briefly, was just. Um... A lot of people are interested in the effect of trees on air temperatures and uh, whether, and a lot of people are out trying to make measurements and look at the impacts of forest patches and, and their structure. I was just curious, I assume somewhere that's going to be part of the measuring model. Yeah, so the question was the interest in measuring the role of trees and their impact on temperature. And yes, that's something we're actively doing partly with the weather stations, partly with some other devices that we can put in trees and measure. So, yes. And so that that feeds into trying to understand that relationship so that when if we're going to propose or some mitigation strategy, we need to know the relationship between how much planting trees actually cool the air or change the air quality. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I think we might take one more. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I've heard the word community a lot throughout the presentation. I'm curious to know how has the work um, over the past year so far benefited the community? So the question was how the work that we've been doing over the past year, how has it benefited the community? Um, I'll, be answer, I'll answer honestly, we are still in a spin-up phase. We don't have a lot of measurements going on right now. We do have some models. And I think our intention is once we have things in place and we can start to make those measurements um, routinely and with more ease, we are very, very excited to partner with the community and identify places where we can use some of these tools that we have to help answer questions that you guys have. But I would say this past year has been a spin-up year and we're not we're not quite there yet. Um, so the plan in the future is to have the community identify sites for scientists to collect data. That seems to be more beneficial to the scientists. I'm not hearing clearly how the work will directly impact the community. Um, we all know that climate change is real. Um, we know that it's having a devastating impact on communities of color. We, we have funding available to get data, but it seems like we're more interested in getting granular data um, to further prove the point that we already know. What kind of intervention um, studies, international studies that directly benefit the community uh, do you both have uh, planned? So the, the question is, well, I guess the uh, end of the question was, what kind of interventions do we have kind of planned? So this this project yeah, doesn't, really yeah. So this project doesn't have, as far as I know, kind of concrete actions. It's, it's more building the science for it. But we are in communication with the city about other kind of proposed kind of implementations that could happen. So we're at this stage, 
that I would say for the community, one is we're trying to get these measurements set up so that we can go, when there is a chance to do an implementation, we can test it and see what impact it makes. And so the first stage to do that is to be able to set up to be making these measurements. And so that's, I guess that's where the, the stage we are. The second area that's not necessarily action is that kind of community education and community education. And so that's an area that we haven't quite started yet, but that's an area like for these weather stations, I think that's an area where we're very open to having discussions with the community to say, how can we use these data for education, other kind of purposes? I don't know if it probably didn't yeah, answer it good enough. Yourself, yeah, really yeah. I, I agree. This, I think that's that's a discussion I think we want to get out of these meetings. So I'm... Can I have 30 seconds to answer the follow-up question? Um, this happens frequently. We know the air is bad. We know that people of color are impacted disproportionately. What we can do with the data that we're generating is start to quantify that. And that sounds boring. It sounds very scientific. But the reality is if we can start putting numbers on that difference and we can put numbers that have health relevance to them on that air quality measurement that we're doing, that can initiate action. That can initiate regulatory agencies to take it more seriously. And so if we're using these detailed measurements to highlight a problem that we know exists, but now can quantify, we can start to initiate that action. And this is something that we've been doing in other areas as well. This is a common issue. We don't just want to make the measurements to make the measurements and say, hey, your air is bad. It doesn't end there. It can't end there. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to take those measurements and do something with them. And so I hear you. Once we get spun up, I want to continue to have these conversations and figure out what we can do um, to not just make the measurements, but, but to do something with them. Well, I think we have to do uh, three and then we'll, we'll break for everything. So we do neon gases, building and energy, and transportation, and then we'll be here. In that order? Let's do it in that order. Yeah. Which one? Gas is right. Where was it? Yes. No. Shoot. Oh, that's a cross cut for tomorrow. There it is. Yes. Thanks. It looks similar. Hey folks, my name is John Duncan. I'm at Penn State and I've been helping with this greenhouse gas team. It does certainly relate to the air quality and atmospheric dynamics groups. It's a blend of that as well as some of the ecosystem science. So greenhouse gases are one part of the pollution issue going on here. Let's see. So greenhouse gases, what are we talking about? Carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. There are many others, but those are the three that we've really been focusing on. They help, they're, you know, a little bit of them are good. They help keep Earth livable, right? Without them, uh, the planet, we wouldn't be here, right? But human activities, as we know, um, are increasing these greenhouse gases and they're exacerbating or, you know, making worse climate change. So Baltimore has been doing a lot in this space, the city has. So the Climate Action Plan has set some pretty ambitious goals. 30% um, reduction by 2025, and the plot here is just through time from 27, or 2007, 2017, 2018, 19, and 2020. This is work out of Scott Miller's group at Johns Hopkins. He's the co-lead on this. Their group has really been helping Baltimore figure out the scope of the problem. What is the inventory of emissions? And you can see the city is, is getting a little bit better. It's not quite meeting objectives yet, or the, the lofty goals that they've set, and you know, likely is not going to be carbon neutral by 2045, but it's heading in the right direction. And so um, these translational goals, basically to get to follow on to the, the last part of that conversation and discussion is to provide actionable information on Baltimore's greenhouse gas emissions and the mitigation pathways or the, you know, what do we do about this? We know it's bad, but what do you do about it? 
because we don't yet scientifically know what makes the most sense for our next dollar spent, right? And so some questions that come out of that uh, very closely relate to the last two presentations. How do these greenhouse gas emissions vary across Baltimore, spatially and through time? As the city is changing, as transportation infrastructure is changing, as buildings and construction wanes and, and ebbs, there's gonna be changes there. And trying to better understand those greenhouse gas emissions is a really central part of this. Because the climate is warming and it's getting stormier, that's also gonna have a profound effect, right? So the follow-on question is how do those greenhouse gas emissions through across the city and through time change in a warming, wetting climate? And then getting back to that management aspect or the mitigation, how can we reduce those emissions in a way that's cost effective, but also fair and fair in terms of cost burdens, transportation access, human comfort and lots of other dimensions, right? And so really trying to, to put the people back into this. Um, and looking at some of the work um, on the Baltimore greenhouse gas inventories, the charts there are showing emissions by sectors. So this first one is stationary energy, just meaning stuff that's really not moving, right? So industry, commercial outfits, uh, residential buildings is the bottom of that. The top little bar there is just gas that's accidentally leaving, fugitive gas. Um, the middle bar there is the transportation sector and then the waste that's generated in the city. So solid waste disposal is the that top yellow line. That orange line is the incinerator that um, is a plays a prominent role in the waste parts of greenhouse gas emissions for the city. And then the, there's a little red sliver down there at the bottom under the waste category for waste water. So these are emissions coming off of, of the ponds at the wastewater treatment plants. So in terms of some of the fundamental science that's been motivating um, the greenhouse gas work, it's basically trying to figure out how does infrastructure, and here we're talking about buildings, building design, as well as transportation, how does that impact emissions? My little role in this, I'm helping a subset of uh, folks figure out what greenhouse gases are being emitted or absorbed by plants and soil. So the ecosystem is doing something, right? This, the soils and the plants across the city have a role in this. It's small in the city center when there's tons of buildings, tons of cars, tons of traffic, but it's still an important role. And it's something that, you know, as was alluded to earlier, we're trying to do something about. As Baltimore is trying to plant more and more trees, it's a, it, that part's gonna be changing and trying to figure out by how much. And then the third one there is what's the impact of proposed emissions policies under climate change? So basically trying to figure out if there's going to be new policies at city, state, federal levels, how is it going to work uh, and what are going to be the impacts of those policies in a changing climate? This uh, is a figure that we've borrowed from Pete. Thanks, Pete. Um, driving around with basically the predecessor version of that Amazon mobile or mobile. <laughs> the, uh, I need coffee or food. Um, the uh, that mobile lab, right? And so, driving this thing around and getting some natural gas leaks, uh, at least suspected mobile gas, uh, natural gas leaks in East Baltimore. So more of that data will be collected um, as we spin up here. So what have we done so far? Getting back to the the start of this discussion, we've been doing lots of planning, trying to figure out, you know. What are we going to do? Where are we going to do it? And so there's been equipment ordering. Um, there's still supply chain issues, things like that. But things are coming in and we're getting closer and closer to being able to get a whole lot of data. So the logistics specifically of when, where and how often to sample and then calibrating some of the greenhouse gas data from the low cost network is part of this, as well as from the portable measurements that we're going to be um, using. So what's next, it goes back to this working with community members, trying to figure out where scientifically makes the most sense, who wants this data, um, site access, number of observations, how many times might we have to go out to visit a property? And then these new measurements that are gonna be starting soon. And so our group is gonna be doing a bunch of these uh, mobile greenhouse gas flux measurements. And so it's basically um, big backpacks and briefcases walking out with the chamber that we're gonna set down for a few minutes at a time, 
to be able to measure those three, the carbon dioxide, the methane, and the nitrous oxide. Flux towers, uh, as has previously been mentioned, there's gonna be two of those going up. Um, Pete's mobile air quality lab. And this is really the start of lots of discussions and intercomparisons. How are we finding things across the city and uh, between Baltimore and other places? So, and I think that is my last slide. Who's next? Which is, I'll let you do this. It's a building. No, stay and then, does F5 work? Oh, great. Okay. So, um, my name is Wang Dazuo. Uh, I'm a professor at Penn State. I'm also one of the co leader um, in the um, building energy scene. As you can see, we have really a lot of participants in, in this theme. So here are the names of the people who um, participate in our regular meetings. Okay, um, so our team, I think actually we are consume a lot of information you know, collected by my colleagues in the uh, air quality and atmosphere science. And then we're trying to use those information to make different recommendations or make informed de decisions to improve our building environment reduce energy consumptions. As you know, uh, in the US, people spend about 90% of time inside the building, and buildings account for about 70% of electricity consumptions, and also 30% about e and CO2 emissions. So we play important role, and also it impacts people's daily life. So uh, in this theme, uh, we're trying to understand what are the you know, long-term effects of increased urban density on the building energy use, and also embodied carbon, and also operational carbon. Um, so the second question we want to understand is how we try to address the energy burden or energy um, property issue in Baltimore, as we know. So um, this is big problem in the low income community. And the third one is trying to see how can we do intervention? I think the, the community member asks us what, what's gonna happen from this project, right? We're trying to understand what are the cost effective building rich strategies suitable for this community so that we are able to help you to reduce energy burden, reduce CO2 emission. And then the last one is now also explore potential renewable energy integration. And in the US, the country is moving to electrification, right? So buildings are converted from natural gas to electricity. How we adapt our buildings uh, um, according to this trend and how can we take advantage of the government funding like inf infrastructure bill? So the approaches we take, um, there's different tools we're using. For example, Urban Lab is a uh, community energy modern tool developed by the National Renewable Energy Lab. So it can integrate both buildings, renewable energy, microgrid, digital energy systems. We're trying to explore, can we design the future community by using more um, a diversified energy source? So a real talk is not a tool developed by Unreal, and also we had developing in-house models to understand the largest scale being energy consumption. So this would be useful for the PG, uh, BGE or energy policy makers. For example, if BGE want to give an in, uh, incentive for a certain building energy efficient measure, they can see what will be the most effective solution for certain neighborhoods. Or we can also talk to city or in a state government, how should they spend the tax re return of no, other incentives to help our neighborhoods. And um, then we also have developing in-house energy paths, open city code, that we can model every single building. So if you talk to individual homeowner, right? So you can fix your leaking window or you can replace your uh, AC, uh, a, a, anything you have cost, then what is the savings? What is the return on investment? Then people can make informed decision. So last but not least is using the machine learning models to do large scale building energy modeling because Create a model for every single building takes a lot of time. If you want to scale it up, it's not feasible. You need using AI technology or other technologies to learn from the, the models, but predict the result much quicker. Okay, the top science research question we have is how the building react to future uh, urban climate. So for example, we know, so um, the temperature is rising every year. So for those neighborhoods without air conditioning, what's the impact to them? How can we avoid the potential casualty caused by the heat waves? And also, 
how bit energy consumption will increase because of the extreme um, weather conditions. And the next one is um, how urban design correctly impact energy efficiency and equity. So for example, you know, the density of the population, the housing characteristics, even we do the primal trees, how that impact our buildings. The last part on this is really how can we address the um, carbon emission problem. Also, again, the government is pushing very hard. Then how can those housing stock characteristics impact the carbon emission? How can we make informed policies uh, for our cities? So the translation research question include, so then again, how can we uh, help our building owners reach for their building, adapt to future uh, climate? Or if, when we design a new building, how can we design it you know, for the future weather? And also, based on um, contribution, we'll see how can we address energy poverty in Baltimore, right? So because you know, same energy efficient measure may not work for the low-income low community. Um, the progress. Uh, first, um, we have created the Reno-based 3D digital model for the Broadway Eastern neighborhoods. That's uh, one of the focus neighborhood we want to study. The idea that after we have the model, then we can put in building physics, we can start to run energy simulation to understand you know, uh, potential impact to this community. And then we're also trying to get more information about that community, like for example, the census data, because we need to do energy burden. And then the, um, the next one is to create a more detailed building energy model from townhouse, which is very popular in the neighborhood in Baltimore, but is, is missing um, in the um, DOE's building, uh, prototypical building energy models. And then we also trying to understand the relationship between the air quality. In, in this case, we use CO2 as an indicator to build energy consumption. For example, we know if you do more outdoor air, you can reduce CO2 consumption, but you, you will potentially increase energy consumption because you need more energy to condition the air. And then the next one is we're trying to see, can we do AV, model AV single building using more realistic information, basically create digital team for every single building. Here we're looking for online housing data, for example, we can, from Zello or Redfin. We can see the building construction year, square footage, air conditioning type, right? So um, no, the, the floors, number of floors, then we can create our model more realistically to run a simulation. Um, no, the dream is that can we create an energy score for every single building? Now, if you go to Velo, you can see the estimated price, right? Can we create estimated energy consumption for that building? And so last but not least, we also uh, run the uh, urban off simulation, focused on 18 residential buildings and two commercial buildings, trying to get a good understanding of the, um, the neighborhood. So the plan for the next year are beyond, because we're trying to create an entire workflow. So uh, right now we're still developing models, apply our methods. You can see the um, application is really trying to do the, uh, how to reduce energy usage, how to reduce the uh, energy burden, reduce carbon emissions. So we're taking different approach, create individual model, or um, also we can do large scale modelings. Um, yeah, so uh, as a summary, um, in our theme, we're trying to address from the single building to a group of buildings all the way to the city scale. So we're developing tools to fit the different purposes. That's all, thank you. All right, I stand between you all in dinner, so I have that unlucky position. Uh, once again, I'm Celeste Chavis with Morgan State, and I lead the transportation theme. So we are a little bit different where you've heard from many of our my colleagues, how they talk about the role of transportation and the importance when it comes to looking at climate change. And so as we know, the transport transportation sector is uh, responsible for more um, domestically produced greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector of our economy. And also we have to be aware of how climate change impacts the resiliency of our transportation system. And so those are kind of the two things that we're focused on in the transportation theme. 
And so this is just looking at kind of the sources of transportation air pollution. We are focusing more so on, well, definitely focusing on the on-road part of um, transportation um, impacts. And here we're looking at some of the solutions. And so our group, which is a group of mighty three people, you saw how many were in the previous theme. We are a theme of three. Uh, we tend to focus more on the planning uh, side of things as well as travel behavioral side of transportation. So it's a little bit unique. So where we kind of lie is, you know, being the people to look at if we change behavior, if we mode shift, how does that reflect in what we're seeing in the environment? So some of the questions, of course, is how can we reduce um, emissions related to transportation? Our group is not focused on like vehicle design. We're definitely focused on the planning and operation side of this question. We definitely want to understand where the most vulnerable parts are of our transportation system today so that we can then rectify that. And one of the questions that we're really also interested in is who bears the burden of the um, transportation related emissions and who is contributing to those locally, right? So even though this is a Baltimore focused uh, group, we know that people are coming in and out of Baltimore from elsewhere, right? So who lives here, who's bearing the burdens may not be the same people who are contributing um, to, to those emissions. And so um, those are some of the things that we're interested in. So we're interested in how do you shift um, people to sustainable modes of transportation, like transit, biking, and walking, as well as to cleaner um, vehicles, such as electric vehicles. Um, one of our questions is how do we nudge people equally? Um, most people know that one of the most common ways of getting people to shift in transportation is through pricing. And that is not an economic, that's not an equitable way of making people um, stop driving, right? Because that's basically saying those who can't afford are the ones who are helping the earth and those who can't afford get to drive, right? So we want to look at other ways of kind of encouraging that shift to sustainable transportation. As I said before, uh, looking at vulnerable areas. So this is really plugging into some of the work that's happening in the other themes, such as if we see where um, there's flooding in our um, in Baltimore, we can overlay that with the transportation network, whether it be our road network, our bus lines, and see where there's potential for um, having those systems fail um, due to effects like flooding. And then of course, there's the operations and behavioral side of transportation, whether it be um, better street timings with our signals or having people change how they are traveling, whether it be what they're traveling in, what mode, or how far they're traveling, how often. So looking at travel patterns and how that relates to um, climate change with transportation. So what's been done very so far? Frankly, very little in my theme. As I said, we are a theme of three. Um, we are pretty new, but there's good to that. It means you can help us and you can influence uh, what we're doing. And this call to action is to both the researchers and community members, government folks, everybody is welcome. And they are part of this call to action. Um, so you can help influence what we're doing since it's very early on. Um, so there's a QR code where you can fill out a form and I would be happy to hear from anyone um, to hear either what you think we should be working on or if you wanna participate in some of the stuff that we are doing. Yes. Very much discussion within your group to the corridor. Not specifically. Um, we are talking, we've been talking more overarching on mode shifts, of which uh, transit is one, but we'd be happy to hear if there's something specific from the community about how we can impact or influence um, that. So yeah, so plans for the next year um, are to liaison with the themes that there's a whole lot of overlap 
both of which you've heard from um, before me, which is greenhouse gases and air quality. And then we are in the process of developing our kind of first research project. Um, one thing that I'm interested in or that our team is interested in that really impacts that mode shift is really understanding how people view sustainable transportation. Does it impact their decisions? Because frankly, usually cost and time tend to be the more important factor. So kind of understanding how people are making those decisions um, as it relates to sustainability. There's some kind of low hanging projects that we can do in partnership with some of the other groups. Um, one thing is looking at vulnerability at um, bus stops and heat exposure. Uh, we have some work um, looking at EV, electric vehicle adoption and some barriers um, to EV adoption and how policy can maybe um, make that um, a more feasible mode. And then also, as I said before about flooding and the vulnerabilities here um, in, in Baltimore. So that's what I have, thank you. We can get a few minutes for dinner for questions for Celeste, John, and Rhonda. I want to ask the same question I asked a few different things. Um, it's been a year of funding. I'm coming at this from a community perspective. Um, we're both the folk of Baltimore and the plight of the folks of Baltimore. Um, largely the reason why this grant is funded and so i'm curious to know why nothing had been done thus far with a year of funding from each team in terms of uplifting the folks of Baltimore. i mean it's a it's a tough question right i mean we're trying to figure out some of the science stuff um and so that's where we're trying to get our dust in a row. And I think there's a lot of hard work to be done there. And you know, I think the real answer to your question is on the implementation side. And this came up in the very first all hands meeting. Um, and so trying to figure out how to go from the science we know how to do to actually implement a lot of this. That, I mean, that's what we're getting at, right? And uplifting the community. It's hard, and there's not a lot of money in this grant to actually like put in a lot of these um, mitigation measures or management measures, or you know get people EVs or change the housing stock. And so, what we're trying to figure out, you know, is that he was saying how to get the numbers to help inform policy to do that. And you know, I think that's going to be one of the things that we've got to keep working with our there is a community engagement team and folks here and on the steering committee trying to keep um, ears to the ground to let opportunities come through for funding that we can help try to get proposals out and do other things to get the actual implementation from folks. It's not a very compelling answer, I know, and that's that's my piece. I'll defer to my co-presenters here. Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Uh, I think you know, we only get a very small amount of funding to develop the tool. Then really we need to partner with the like the utility or other you know, government agency to leverage the their resource. We can provide no information for that so that they can make decisions with strategic community. Mm -hmm. um, right. So um I'm gonna ask you to so um, there are things that are being done, and it's in one of my questions that's going to have for you, John. When you said you spent the year trying to plan out where everything is going to be, when looking at the locations for doing any monitoring, is it really a, a spatial density that you're looking at, or are you also trying to target areas where there is going to be change happening during the next three to five to three? But now you're four to five years. Um, that you could actually see that measurement. Because I, I think um, when we're talking about all these things, I don't know of any implementation that doesn't have some kind of trade-off with it. Uh, for instance, you plant a tree, but if you plant a tree next to an overhead power line, that, that group may still lose power in the middle of a heat wave, right? Um, and, and more to the point, if you're able to see that change, in your models, are you also looking to see how much change needs to happen? You know, how much of that implementation needs to happen before you actually really get a signal? Because I think 
we try to take it so small and then get frustrated that we're not seeing that big difference. So I'm gonna go with my first question. Are you trying to do the measurement where there's actual change happening over the next uh, four years? So this is kind of, I'll answer this uh, first from the greenhouse gas team where we're trying to do a bunch of things, right? There's a whole ton of things like uh, Peter Goffman just got 20 plus years of long-term greenhouse gas data. So trying to take that, leverage that, the neighborhood that have been selected, right? Um, Broadway East and Old Goucher. There's two towers that were trying to nest measurements within. There's also the water uh, team that Larry Van and Shirley Clark, she's here, and Claire Welty are running, where there's watershed that are in the, uh, the different area. And so, luckily for me, I, I just talked about the backpack that our team has got um, and the briefcase, and so we can go wherever to get these measurements. It's easier for us. For some of the folks that have got to pick a set location, it's going to be different, right? And so I would say, um, if I could try to put on my VSEC hat and and uh, if I were Ben, and I should have heard Ben, but I think it's that's the greenhouse gas answer for my little piece of the the soil emission of greenhouse gas. But I think your bigger question relates to all of these things, right? And all of these things, and the answer is going to be probably slightly different given the constellation of things that we're trying to balance. What's out there? How much money do we have for new measurements? And how do we um, Try to move forward in a way that, that's possible. On the, you know, how much signal can we get? How much management can you throw at this thing? And does the problem go away? I think that's going to be different, right? And it will be different for like green infrastructure with respect to the storm water than for greenhouse gases. Yeah. I thought Celeste, I, I loved your presentation uh, and some of the thinking that was going on because. Transportation is both very important going forward, but also there are many people in Baltimore who currently are contributing to the solution. They're taking the bus. <laughs> and those bus stops can get hot. So I think you're I think that the possibility of finding solutions coming from the community that will connect to capacity and things that are being measured by VSEC is, is one of the best opportunities I've heard of the of the short-term solutions. Uh, I, I thought that was great. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, it's shabby, kind of leveraging the other question. I mean, in the world of transportation, we have a kind of short-term thing that we can look at now, but then a lot of the longer-term things that, you know, like changing where people live, how far they're driving, how far they're traveling, we can't really feasibly do in the same time frame as a grant. And that's definitely a shortcoming with these kind of short-term grants versus kind of real climate change efforts take a much longer time frame to look within the bucket of, of these three questions. Thank you for the last question before. So go ahead. Oh, boy, no pressure. <laughs> uh, thank you all for presenting. Um, and the monitoring of different metrics, um, especially with dealing with greenhouse emissions, um, is dealing with urban densities and, and energy distributions. I guess the question I'll ask is, is in a part of trying to monitor and calculate what those reductions would look like based on the data that's collected, are there any, have there been any considerations for um, as utilities like a BGE upgrades their infrastructure to reduce more of their energy losses? Um, when they're distributing energy into the grid, into infrastructure, uh, has any of that been factored into the research or the modeling that will take place in the generation of the grid? So I wish that I'm Dylan not here to be. I don't think he could make it tonight. So um, Dylan and Scott Miller, um, that's partly their expertise, and I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I can certainly get an answer. I know that they've talked about it, but they, they, I recall correctly, some of those discussions have been about getting projections, but first is the specificity, sure. and I think we're still waiting. We, the collective research side of this, um, they're waiting for more more specific data from some of the utilities. Yeah, the proposition is that for every kilowatt that's going in, you're losing up to 50 percent just in storage and heat loss. So we need to sort of see how. Yeah. If I could make one one comment um, that goes to the precipitating act, which is that sometimes the discussion is how the science can 
be relevant to policy planning management. I think another part to this, and I, I'm surprised that I'm going to say this, but you know, there is a role for economists here. And what I mean by this is, is to say, what's it worth? Like, what costs will we avoid if these policies happen? And then to find out who will benefit by avoiding those costs. It could be reduction in hospitalizations. It could be reductions in the cost of homes. And so um, trying to think what would be the environmental impact bond, what would be the environmental or social impact bonds is another lever to push on to support the change in contrast to raising taxes or asking for foundations to pay for. And so if we can translate the science into we're saving someone some money, and that can help precipitate the action, not just what should the action be, but what it's worth, that, that should be something that we're considering. On that note, we're gonna head for dinner. So Celestia, you're going to the next building, right? Is there anything? Yeah. Even though we're going to dinner. Yeah, we have a point though. There'll be there'll be people pointing towards dinner. Um and we're gonna we're gonna just, just a few minutes later. I'm just gonna say aspiration. We're gonna get back to this room at seven o'clock, 45 minutes. That's an aspiration. This room at seven. At that time there should be some food, some food, some discussion stuff. So uh come on back and then we'll get to our breakout at the end to discuss how we can things actually. So hello everyone, my name is Antonia Haji Michael. It's a long weird Greek name. I work at Penn State and I lead with Mike Bader, the decision science team. We are three. My graduate student Ava is also helping us with it. Uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about what our team has been up to and what we um want to keep doing in the try to talk a little talk closer yeah, to the you. microphone. Okay. I could also hold it. It's the back of the room that needs to hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can just talk louder. Is that better? <laughs> and also use this microphone? It, okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, so why why do we need a decision science team or decision analysis team, even in the first place? So, well, we in, in this project and also in many other climate adaptation or climate solutions problems, you you typically tackle many problems at the same time. You have to consider many things. So, in in this case, in visit, we're considering different sorts of problems that you've heard from the domain experts about all these problems that they're working on. But then for any one of these problems, and I'm just picking one here just for illustrations, but all of them are important. Um, there's many potential ways we could go about it. So there's many potential solutions. And the, the challenge becomes, how do I pick? How do I approach my problem? How do I make decisions? And the, to make these decisions, what we typically have to deal with or understand better and um, manage is really like, what is that solution? If I implement it, if I choose a possible course of action, what does it look like in the world? And and <laughs> if you translate it into to English, what I really mean is like, who, who would live with it? How do they perceive it? Do they um, like it? Do they hate it? Because it looks ugly or for whatever other reason. So like, how are we really capturing the values of the people that live with these solutions uh, or these proposed solutions. And then the other key dimension that's hidden slightly behind this slide is if I am going to implement a solution or some climate change adaptation and I'm putting it somewhere where it's gonna be for 30, 50, 100 years, I care about how that is going to perform, how, how well it's going to do for the next 50 years. Yeah, so we have both the values, which are very important, so a solution needs to be acceptable and meet the needs of the community, and also it needs to perform well uh, based on what we know. So, so decision analysis help us sort of navigate this complexity, and it really is an interdisciplinary um, field that combines different methods from different other disciplines to essentially examine and assess possible paths of action 
and identify the ones that help us both achieve our goals and are also robust to things in the future, to uncertainty, to climate change. Um, so, so in relating to like why why should the community care about this team existing in in, in BSEC is that our role is to try and bring together this state of the art art science that you've been hearing about to to work on these problems. And some of the questions that we're trying to ask is how would some of these potential science-informed solutions come together to meet the multiple goals and objectives that we have or that the community has that may be different when you move into different communities. Then another question that we, we wanna, we care about addressing is how would um, future conditions get in the way of meeting these objectives? So if I implement the solution, what would it look like in, in 30 years? So what is the uncertainty there? What is that dimension? And then finally, how, how, should, we, how should we be designing adaptive pathways or adaptive climate solutions that are both robust to this uncertainty, to the things that could go wrong, and also um, have equ equitable community outcomes. Um, in terms of like the science questions, because I have to also, you know, do my science as a, 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 in my discipline. Um, I'll tell you that in the state of the art in this community typically relies in this advanced computational approaches that we, we, we use to explore all the possible options and all the possible uncertainties and the futures. And we run the simulations a million times to find answers. But because of this high complexity, we often fail to engage with the stakeholders meaningfully and deeply into finding these solutions. So, so what I've identified in my own work as an expert in this area is that there is this gap between the high fancy advanced things I can do in my lab at Penn State and what the stakeholders actually care about and need. So I think our science contributions here are also very important uh, because through our work in BSEC, we could help advance even the science uh, by developing approaches that are what I would call community embedded. Um, so we are advancing not only what the community needs, but also the how the science is done in a better way. Um, so I have to take, I think I'm gonna just cut this. So what we've been doing so far, um, actually I like the slide, the title here, is that framing the problem is the problem. And that's my motto, motto in life in general. But like we've been working a lot on this framing question. So if I have all these complexities and the uncertainties and all the things I can do and all the values I want to take, it, to take into account, how do I put it together and figure out something feasible, something actionable? How do I uh, not get paralyzed by the complexity, but make it actionable into a pathway that I can used to adapt. So we've been um, sort of help coordinate this sort of framing exercise with the scientists of the team, but also recently we started moving more to be doing this with the community more. So we already had the, the heat um, problem, the, the heat community engagement, and that wasn't uh, explicitly in the same way that we did with the scientists, but it's a move in this direction of capturing and bringing in these, these values. Um, so in moving forward, our team is in charge of coordinating these decision analytic approaches across the different teams in BSEC. Uh, we work, we tend to work closely with the community engagement team for obvious reasons. So because we want to bring in the community and we kind of act as this connective tissue with the science teams. Um, and then on our own, we're also starting now to work with now, now we have a graduate student starting to work with hopefully the water team to prototype a, a demonstration of one of these applications. And we're also looking to hire a postdoc on air quality to do the same. Um, and I think that's all I have. Do we need this? Okay, veg and soils. You're faster than I am. Something. Oh, with them. I'll do this in the meantime while you work on that. Maybe.
Here we go. Vegetation and soils and windows cannot complete the extraction. What? Oh, goodness. All right. I mean, it's over here. I think I can do it. All right. Sorry. This, some, this drive is no longer accessible here. So it's not letting me open it here. Is it already open, maybe? Ah, oh, it's already is open. It, Thank goodness. Already... All right, good. All right. Sorry about that. Let me move this down quick. And how do I change slides? Um, you just click. Oh, like that. Like so. You can either use the mouse or the the Okay. Great. I'm gonna to talk to us about um, the vegetation and soils theme. I my name is Megan Avolio, and there's a few of us in the theme. So Cities are a really wonderful place to live, but maybe environmental quality is not one of the reasons to choose to live in cities. There's a lot of environmental things about cities that are undesirable, such as poor air quality, poor water quality, flooding, extreme heat, several others. And often it's suggested that we can just have um, a solution to this is to either use green or brown infrastructure, to use nature-based solutions, or greening in general will alleviate all these or many of these urban ills. And so plants and soils are expected to ameliorate all these conditions and have positive um, impacts on the outcomes. But it's important to remember that a lot of these poor urban conditions are actually also stressors for these plants and for the soils. Like us, they are living organisms and they're not ideal conditions for them to be growing and living in. So this really gets to the heart of the why is understanding vegetation and soils important because we want these organisms to a lot for us, but we're putting them in hard, uh, difficult situations. Another reason to study this is that we know that there is an unequal distribution of trees across Baltimore City. This is a map showing um, canopy cover and there's a great range in where the trees are. Um, so this is something that we know needs to be addressed. And another reason to care about vegetation and soils is beauty and aesthetics. And here are some pictures of great trees that I've found personally uh, throughout Baltimore. So the focal research question that we as a group are asking are what plant soil conditions are best to achieve desired environmental outcomes. And I've listed here the environmental outcomes are really focused on, such as reducing extreme heat, reducing flooding, improving air and water quality, and reduce CO2 emissions. So the focal basic sign questions behind that is across different land use types, how does soil health affect tree growth and water infiltration? And we're gonna go across Baltimore and collect a lot of data we're going to hand this data off to our uh, modeling partners, and our modeling partner is going to use this to understand how well do their um, this got a little mess up. How well do their models work to understand how Baltimore uh, is actually or is performing today? And then if we find a good match between what's being modeled today and what we actually measure, then we can predict into the future what will the environment look like in the future. And so another big question we have is how can we represent urban vegetation and soils into climate hydrology and air quality models? What's been done so far? Well, we've gone out and started collecting, collecting some data. Um, we measured soil physical properties and soil water infiltration across several different land use types, including uh, urban forest patches, vacant lands, and parks. And we started to make preliminary measurements of tree growth and um, tree water use stress across different land use types in Baltimore, including um, street trees, trees growing in lawns, and then trees growing in urban forest patches. And we've also started to run some preliminary earth system models with existing data that we have to start creating a baseline of how well do the models work with the data that we currently have. What do we plan to accomplish in the next year? Um, we're going to go out and measure a lot more things. So we've gotten this preliminary data and we're going to go try and uh, do it at a bigger scale. So in the footprint, we're going to do these measurements at two, two locations broadly in the footprints of the flux towers and then an additional 50-ish sites across Baltimore. And in each of these locations, we're gonna measure soil characteristics and we're gonna measure plant characteristics that you can see listed here. And so we wanna end with saying that to really do this well, we really need the help of our community partners. We want feedback on what the questions are and concerns are of the community related to plants and soils. One of the things we need to, we know we need to do is that a lot of vegetation and soils are actually found on private lands. So we need permission to go to these private lands and a lot of it is on residential lands. So we'd like to um, work with our community members to find uh, residential yards we can go and visit, visit repeatedly and to understand who else should we should be talking with that we're not yet. And that's all I have, thanks so much.
All right. And for our final PT presentation, Yashing, are you going to give the presentation? For Yashing and Chris? No, yes, Yashing. All right. Great. Talking about the critical issues of data associated with these projects. So that's already open. I can do it. All yours. Great. And yeah, let's turn that back on for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Yashin Wei. I'm from Oak Ridge National Lab. I co-lead the BSEC Data and Software Management Support Team together with Chris Forrest from Penn State. And Penn's there, and we are both on the screen. Okay. So, an overview. Why do we need the data and software management support team? Bottom line, this is a requirement. There is a require <laughs> from the policy that we need to make sure that federally funded research outcomes are free and immediate and equitable accessible to the general public. And that's the bottom line. But we also want to make sure that we can help both BSAC research investigators, and also our community stakeholders and the public to access the data, the software codes, and the scientific outcomes that we produce um, in a, a quickly and equitable manner. And to do that, we follow the FAIR principles, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, and these are the four focuses of our management support effort. Okay, so um, the DOE funded MSD Live is the main uh, platform that we are leveraging for BSEC to manage the uh, data products as well as the software products. And we have a BSEC project uh, uh, established on MSD Live uh, website. And you can actually create a free account on MSD Live and request to join the BSEC project. And why you want to join the BSEC project? A couple of reasons. First, you have some data, you have some software you want to share, and you need a B um, MSD Live account to do that. And also some of our data are preliminary and they are not uh, ready for public release yet. So we make them restricted to BSEC investigators and BSEC stakeholders um, at this moment. So you will need a B uh, MSD Live account, which um, belong to the BSEC project to access those resources. And from the MSD Live website, you can find the data and the software resources we currently have, but we have a shorter URL. Uh, thanks, Darren, for creating this tiny URL. Following this URL, you can see a complete list of BSEC data um, right now. We don't have many. We have three um, products, but um, it's growing. And I'd like to highlight this very first um, data set we have publicly released just a few days ago. This is the weather data from Darren's um, group leading on the BSEC weather station across Baltimore. And this is the DUI is working and this is a citation. And we're still working on um, curating the author lists, um, better citation, but the idea is you have a resolvable DUI and you have a formal citation that you can publicize in your um, whatever resume or website encourage people to cite and reuse your product. So um, to get started, so we really encourage you to sign up for an MSD Live account. It's a free account. You can sign up and then request to join the BSEC project on MSD Live and explore BSEC data records and also um, data records from other projects on MSD Live. And you can learn more about MSC Live and how to contribute uh, data and software resources and how to use the website to do search. Um, there are other useful resources that you can uh, learn about. 
And finally, I just want to advertise a new data and software survey that Chris and I um, developed and sent out through Slack um, last Friday. And we have two surveys. It's a new version, data survey and software survey. And I want to thank for Ying. I think Ying is the very first person who contributed to the surveys. And I encourage all of you to um, provide the responses to the surveys. And you don't have to wait till your data software are ready to respond to the survey. We really like to know what you have in your mind, um, planning purpose in the near future, or even in the next year or two. But just let us know so we can get better uh, understanding of what's coming out and we can better support you. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jing. Okay, so that's going to be it for the science presentations. Right? Again, a big part of today was to try to share out a little bit of each other as a research team and a big part of what has been going on. So we got to have a few minutes now for questions for any of those four that Yashin, Larry, Megan, or Antonia. And then we'll hear the pivot to the aid of the city's plan. So, any questions for the presenters in the first dinner? The 2023 data survey different from the 2022 data survey, right? So we filled out a survey and saying what data sets we're going to produce. What, what's the second survey? I'll, I'll take that. That's a great question. Um, so um, the main difference, there are a couple of differences. One difference, a main difference is the form, the format of the survey for this new version is different from the previous version. The previous version, we created kind of a Google spreadsheet template. Then we requested each team, team to make a copy of that template and a few entries into that spreadsheet for each team. team. And um, I don't think that's very successful. Uh, so we changed the format, we changed uh, format from a Google spreadsheet into a Google survey. This is a real survey in this new version. And we request actually each individual person to respond to the survey instead of each team to respond to the survey. So if you have something in mind, feel free to respond to the survey. There will be some duplicates um, we expect, but we will do some consolidation after we gather all the inputs. So I hope that will make the work easier for you. So we hope to get more responses from people. And that's the major difference. The other difference um, is we added uh, a few work questions. For example, uh, for the data survey, we added one example, one question asking you, what kind of visualization, access, and exploration capabilities that you would expect on your data that will benefit other people, especially our community stakeholders? And what kind of data exploration, data visualization uh, feature that we may help to develop? For example, some interactive web mapping capability or some plotting capability that we can um, better demonstrate your data to especially community builders. I think we will be able to help you on um, some of those uh, capabilities once we know what kind of capability you are expecting on your data. And the other thing I want to mention is on the software survey, we really want to um, collect um, the GitHub repository that you are currently using. We want to compile a list of that. We want to think of a way to somehow link all those different GitHub repositories that are BTEC related together into one product. So I think that these are the main um, changes that we make. Thank you. Tom, did you send the survey by email or is it on Slack? Um, on Slack. Oh, okay. um, I, I will, I think I will also send out to email. It's, it is in general channel of that. 
Are there questions for what we've heard from since dinner? So. All right. Oh, yep, Valentin. So, Super Antonio, mm -hmm. how has the um, analysis tool of far out scientists and their decision making over the past year as it relates to their community engagement and community benefits? Have you, uh, what was one of the last part? Basically, how have your tool helped scientists thus far? Yeah. So we don't have, it was a training exercise primarily. So a lot of it was primarily even just getting the scientists to talk to each other in the same time. That took a very long time. To this day, I don't think we all talk this year. So even within us, that takes a very long time. Uh, we recently just started this fall, this community engagement session. We already had one. Um, we're about to have two tomorrow. Three of them tomorrow? Yes, and the idea is that we'll be using the sessions to gather more information about particularly the value and preferences of people. And the idea for that is that we will use it as a sort of bridge between what the scientists are doing and what the community wants to see. And we'll use them in our tools, which we are, we are still building. So these are like analytical tools and computational tools that find a way to navigate these options. Yeah, right. four. Yes. So the four sort of topic areas that I showed in the beginning were identified in the all kinds of things that we had in January. Uh, and that was again for community um I'm curious to know if it's so difficult to get scientists to communicate with each other. Um, I, 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 well, I'm actually not surprised. I'm a vision and focus on their particular area of research and their particular question. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit interested in, I mean, I know you probably can answer the question right now, uh, how this decision making tool will benefit. The community. the community. It, it seems as if it's difficult mm -hmm. for it to benefit the scientists who have all this expertise um, well, thus far. Yeah, the, the main goal of this approach and this tool is to, so, so there's a lot of science happening in this way. Um, and I like to make a distinction between there's a lot of useful science and not all of it is usable to address solutions. We do need to put them on the ground. So the idea is that we use approaches to maybe translate some of all the usable science to, to sorry, some of the useful science to become usable to, be, to actually go address something that somebody cares about. It just takes time because there's a lot of complexity. So some of the solutions for some issues might interact with another solution for a different issue. But somebody might not like, so the scientists they might come up with what they think is a brilliant idea. But then the people don't like it, and that's very legitimate. So, like, how do you weigh all this together and adjust it to the people, uh, to everybody's value and everybody's preference? It's just complicated. It's complicated to say that. Yeah, one last follow up question. Um, and I'm sorry for the monopoly information. You guys are kind of trying to get expensive. Um, in terms of the uh, vegetation and soil scheme, how can the decision science team and the decision analysis tool help um, the soil, vegetation and soil team better um, come up with research questions that benefits the community? Um, I feel that they treat that been around for some time. A lot of people all agree um, that we all know how trees work, we know how to grow trees, we know how soil works. And so, in terms of expanding, resources to understanding or studying soil um how does that how can your tool better help uh, the vegetation or any of i'm using the vegetation team as an example uh, but sitting here as a community member listening to folks talk about um understanding how soil tree growing soil uh, I, i'm not sure how that going to benefit my community um I, I think there's a lot of science out there as it pertains to the negative impact of climate change 
on black communities. And uh, I'm still getting a lot of, we want more data. The data is already there. We already know how to grow trees. We know the impact of trees on climate change. What are the interventions in place? What kind of intervention can be crafted using this decision analysis tool to better come up with research questions that benefit the community? Well, I think it's a, so it was more about trees and about decisions, but I could also. So I would say the one thing is um, that obviously we know how to grow trees in the middle, but a lot of what this grant is trying to get is uh, key data into these models. And there actually isn't data on how trees are growing in different urban environments. And so that's one of the prime points that they're trying to collect that it doesn't really exist. And so it's just at a different scale. We have a big picture scale. We do have a finer scale that is needed by our model of partners. The data doesn't exist of how trees actually grow and what their physiology is like in the very, very little actual measurement on that. And so by hopefully by taking these measurements and then understanding how different tree species grow in different environments, we can make better planting decisions about which tree we can wear. So a bit longer, we have to replace them as tree something. And then the grow to greater height will have greater benefit to wide by the species. So we do know that we have a lot of data on soils, but interestingly, most of our soil data in urban environments even are only from the surface. So this part, which is the house, should be very more of this stuff. And so we have very little data in the soil, and this is what we would like to get the data for. Um, in terms of the field work. So what we're doing, for instance, different types of soils and things that we call nervous <laughs> a range of many continuous continuous soils with the soils and resource soils and so it's a whole variety of things. And so we would like to study this variety in terms of things that we different soils Take up water for different seeds. So, in this case, we have a different sort of treatment. We have vacant plots, which are different to the vacant plots, which are vacant plots, which are due to tender, which are tender. And so, um, so, we want to get measurements for the vacant measurement to, to see which one is working better, to give us uniform screens and what happens when they work. And it also informs us better in terms of planting of so we see that the trout in the trees will differ in the trees. So that's what we want to do. We have to learn. We are looking at micronutrients in the soil. We're looking at the versus in the sand. Yeah, we're looking at forest species which have. More or less natural soils, soils which never naturally developed, the very soils in vacant plants which were made by humans, or they have a few companies. So I wonder if what you see from the service is not only has the tools, but that has no role in soaking those plants. We also look at, um, so we were, we, we, uh, in swimming in organizations, making green stores, so they are making green stores, and we measure in those conditions that we see how what they did to those locations, how they did those in the and if I could just just bound you really quick, because I think you touched on two important points, right? So one question is how does the decision tool inform the data that maybe they're collecting? Right? That might be because, oh, we want to know how much a tree equals a neighborhood. And maybe we do have those data, maybe we don't. Maybe they need to collect the data so we can really quantify the uncertainty. 
The second part is, well, how does that help benefit the community or any decision maker, right? And so what Antonia's tools can help us do is say like, okay, we can plant trees. And as you say, we know the benefits of planting trees. Or we can buy everyone an air conditioner and subsidize their electricity, right? And so if we have a certain amount of money to spend, right, that's gonna try that, for example, uh, you know, we can name the objective of the community, but like have, you know, you are heat related deaths or like all these other benefits we might say you wanna reduce heat, right? Should we put that money into trees or should we put it into air conditioners? Right? And then we can say, well, one might cost more, one might cost less. But maybe the tree also provides other benefits that the community cares about. Or maybe the air conditioner provides benefits that the community cares about and the tree has detriment, right? And so what the decision tool allows us to do is to bring all that together in a way that each of these science things we've been hearing about tonight can't do. Okay, we got a lot of, so I, I saw Morgan for, oh, no, what was a Morgan and then over here, and then um, and then maybe we'll get, a, and then last one, we'll do three more and then we'll get to Abe. So we have Morgan. So one thing on data and then, then a question. So uh, on the data, we, we've learned from um, working in the city that actually the fire department has fantastic data on heat related um, medical costs. Those are the first responders. So if you want to map out where that's happening, um, it turns out fire department's the place to go uh, on heat related things. So my question about decision on the decision science, is I, I wonder, you know, because you know, part of what you're dealing with, as you know, is this idea of wicked problems. It's like no one agrees on the defining of the problem, which is part of what makes it wicked. And I wonder whether or not through your work you'll be able to look at how much similarity or differences there are in how people are defining the problems and the interactions among the problems. Because that it, the, the assumption may be like there's a huge gulf among everyone when actually maybe, no, everyone's kind of similar. So I was just wondering if that's gonna be something that you'll be able to tease out from, as you interact with government agencies, various community groups, scientists, and so on. Yeah, I think that from a science perspective, that's not a very interesting question, especially if it's like multi-level decision-making. So you have uh, an individual versus a community versus the city, how are these like in line and we try and solve the problem the very important stuff of how do you do this project. So yeah, I think that's very interesting for me personally, and I'm excited, and I'm hoping to see that about how it works. It seems to me that this project would really benefit um, by bringing in um, GIS system, um, because, you know, it's, it's sort of abstract and particularly in the most of the planners take all of these uh, research pathways and interfere with those. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so we can yeah. all, all, all the different research areas in the region. Yeah, thank you for that. And so yeah, GIS is definitely part of under the hood what's happening right now. I think to your point, what we need to figure out as we move forward is how do we make this something that's not just acceptable to communities, but it's owned by the communities, right? In a way that they can really feel that they're presenting the data in a way that's most meaningful to them. And I think mapping is gonna be a tremendous part of that. Yeah. Is that follow-up we got there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, there are grassroots organizations that's in the city that's actually like the main type of data. Uh, tree trust was in the and in the Google. So those organizations are the main type of data because they're actually on the ground planting trees in the city. And then also, too, we have uh, a software or high tree that gives you that data to look for and how the tree benefits. Um, based off of particular environment they can get. And that, that data from iTree can be shared from uh, someone else is using it anyway. So that maybe having a terrible environment that you can have your fault because it could be an issue to help you out with the soil navigation that GI yeah, has to be able to point out when you start. That's a tool. Absolutely. All right. So I can argue that there's one more question up here and then. This way, the more questions we have, more discussion after the closure of the last public question. 
So yeah, I think my question is a little more broad for all the groups. Um, we've heard a lot about like these networks that are being built to answer your questions for the community, but what metadata is being accumulated for identifying like health risks and actual benefits that you need that's tied to these networks and also identifying environmental local drivers. What are these patterns that we're going to be observing in these air quality networks, water quality networks? Like, there's a lot of data out there that we need to understand like why we're seeing what we're seeing and then how's that tie back to the community and what health benefits or health risks we're seeing. So what else is being looked at beyond just these networks? Yeah, so the health first when we our health genomes are being presented today, but maybe I'm gonna put Bianca on the spot. And can you say that there's one example of how we're integrating this product into health benefits? Yeah. And so specifically for communities, like where we have a lot of communities that we have hypertension feed data, we also have data from statins for comparing We also have health data from the Hawkins medical system. Uh, which is called PIMCO. And so from this, we can study how extreme heat affects adequate assassinations, right? And so that's just one example. Um, and again, like to look at other health options that you're talking about, it really depends on how that data frame of the data and environmental um, like variables are merged together, right? So that's a complex issue, but if you have environmental data and you have health data, you can parse through it, you can do an analysis to kind of study the relationship. But at the moment, we're looking at heat and but again, there's other other things. <laughs> there's one example, we're just trying to get a man down for projects, so maybe I'll leave it there for right now. Point eight, because this kind of gets you for all that. And tomorrow on the key topic, Janae and Smith and others will be uh, talking in some detail about what we're doing on that, particularly for key health and health use. Okay, cut off there. Thank you for the discussion. You guys have great energy considering how late it is on a Thursday evening. So, getting it over to Ava, because as I hope people are aware, there's a massive effort going on in the Baltimore Climate Action Plan that she's uh, leading. And we want to figure out how not just these that, but also a lot of the other energy in this room um, can channel into that effort. So over to you, Ava. Okay, thanks, Ben. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Can you? Well, is it this, this one might oh. be the best. Hold back. Is this better? Maybe if I turn it on. Okay. 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 Is this? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Here we go. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so again, my name is Ava Richardson um, in the city's Office of Sustainability. Uh, so um, really appreciate I have battery spencer, so I don't have a robot. Oh. Just talk about that one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, but that was a weird. No, it's okay. 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 So um, all right. Can, can you hear me now? Um, okay. Does this extend? That's ridiculously short. Oh, it's okay. Ooh, okay, I got it. That's all I'm cool. <laughs> it's fine. It's... Okay. Um, all right, can you hear me okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so uh, we heard about the social, we heard about the environmental, we heard about the science part of the collaborative. Now we're gonna hear about how this is gonna help Baltimore, right? Um, or how it could potentially help Baltimore. So um, just for some background and context, I kind of consider this the city's year of climate action planning. We are updating a few major climate related plans across the city this year, which includes the main one that I'm gonna talk about tonight, um, our climate action plan. Um, and that plan specifically looks at the reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, but we're also we also updated our disaster preparedness plan. Um, and those two plans are respectively our climate mitigation and adaptation plans. Um, our Department of Public Works updated the solid waste management plan for the city, which really outlines a pathway to zero waste um, in, in a circular economy for the city. Uh, our Department of Rec and Park is updating it there. Um, their uh, playbook um, in terms of uh, managing green spaces and parks across the city. Uh, and then we also have um, a couple of other existing plans, including the 2019 sustainability plan, uh, as well as many, many other plans, data analysis, et cetera, across the city that set clear climate goals, um, such as the complete street skylines, our green network plan. And um, I could go on about uh, so many plans for a while that we have for the city, but um, 
Uh, in terms of the climate action plan, I didn't bring a presentation tonight because we are actually uh, updating it based on some public, uh, a lot of public comments and feedback that we have, but I'll provide an overview of kind of like what it's going to be looking at. So we have five sections in the plan, um, and that includes electricity, so how we're electrifying and expanding access to um, 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 uh, clean electricity or uh, supporting that clean energy transition buildings uh, and energy. So roughly 63%, 64% of the city's uh, emissions are attributed to buildings or stationary sources in general. And so we wanna um, figure out like, again, as it relates to residential, commercial, municipal buildings, how we're supporting uh, um, our climate goals within those buildings, transitioning away from any fossil fuel burning in buildings, and then um, cleaning up the grid, essentially, uh, and uh, expanding access to solar and other renewable energy resources. Uh, transportation is the other section, uh, is, is another section. Um, and then we also have waste. And based on the public comments and feedback that we received, we decided to add a section focused on nature-based solutions. Um, and that will likely include kind of like the potential for carbon sequestration but also how we're um, meeting our climate goals um, by expanding um, green space, um, but also uh, vegetation trees uh, across the city as well. And so um, there, because climate action plans typically, again, they look at the reduction of greenhouse gases, there's some things that they don't do. And there's also things that as a city, we don't necessarily um, have the complete control or, or frankly, the resources to do where I see VSEC coming in and, and playing a critical role. So that includes uh, air quality monitoring. That is a function of the state and the state holds the regulatory power for enforcing any air quality um, mechanisms across the city. There was a, a clean air, um, a, a clean air act uh, legislation. It was a local ordinance that did pass, I think, probably like five or six years ago now, but it was challenged in the courts um, and uh, kind of said that if the city didn't have the authority to enforce that, uh, what, what it, which it was basically trying to enforce kind of like air quality um, uh, emissions regulations for um, waste incineration or waste incineration facilities. So um, we have to be realistic. And that's one of the things that we wanted to be conscious about. Like we definitely want know that reducing emissions will improve air quality. But when we're talking about reducing emissions, we're talking about the molecules that warm the planet. We're not necessarily... Um, um, talking about the criteria air pollutants or all the other nasty things in the air that may come along with the uh, greenhouse gases. And so um, we wanted to be really um, conscious about that. And while we want to support in a, a network of hyperlocal air quality monitoring, and we want to support efforts to mitigate um, the impacts of air pollution, we also know that, again, our regulatory power and control in that way, in that um, matter, um, is limited, and we have to work with the state and their air quality um, monitoring efforts in order to move that forward. So I see the weather stations um, installed. Uh, as a result of VSEC and just the um, process, this research process also like informing how we can, especially the modeling, how we can deploy climate solutions that help to support um, or address air pollution in a more systemic way. Also, we've had a goal and we know um, one of the greatest public health threats uh, or um, public health related climate threats is extreme heat. Um, as you heard Bianca say and, and, and um, Ben mentioned. So there's a lot that can be done by leveraging existing um, city resources and investments to also solve for or address or mitigate the public health impacts of uh, heat. And so looking at modeling and looking at data and uh, um, analyzing how can we solve for that when we are also solving for other issues. What is it that we should be doing when we're repaving a street in order to cool that pavement? What is it that we should be doing when we're planting trees in terms of how to plant trees to get the benefits of trees, yes, but to specifically cool to the community in a strategic way and what are, what are the models, what do the models tell us about that? Um, and then I think there's some other key things that we could get um, we can really see the BSEC project benefiting city, the city on. And as you could, as I think it was very clear, there's a lot of data that the researchers have already collected and worked with the city on. But 
um, when we talk about, again, kind of like making progress towards our climate action plan goals, one of our primary metrics is the reduction of greenhouse gases. But there's so many other key and important metrics and measures that we want to be cognizant of that will also reflect progress because year over year, we may not see a major reduction in emissions. And so we know we need other measures of success, other measures of project pro progress, other ways to kind of gauge where we are um, and where we stand in, in um, um, whether or not that's deploying solar or where we stand in um, engaging uh, our residents and particularly um, environmental justice communities around these issues, where we stand in um, supporting and educating people about behavior change mechanisms, mechanisms and also um, assessing and analyzing um, climate investments across the city. So I think there's a real um, benefit there when it comes to how we are informing um, or tracking and informing our future climate action um, planning and implementation goals. Um, also using those models, again, as I mentioned, to target um, climate investments and kind of really getting a better sense of what's the greatest bang for our buck when we come and not, when, excuse me, when we combine different climate, different types of climate investments. And one of the key things that I'm really interested in is how do we solve for multiple climate challenges in, in a single project or in a single initiative? I think so often we're talking about greening or we're talking about mitigating extreme heat um, as if these things happen in silos and more and more, especially given just some of the limited resources and time that we have, like. I want to know how we solve for three to four different climate challenges in a single problem. Um, because one, we're leveraging that investment as best as we can, but we're also providing the greatest benefit to our residents when we think strategically and pragmatically that way. And I think the more that the data and the analysis and the models can give us that sense, the better, especially when it has the financial analysis behind it, so that we know if we deploy projects in this way, can we save money? Can we save taxpayers money? Um, can we better leverage grant dollars, research dollars in, in that way? Um, and then <clears throat> just to also kind of um, put the point out there, because I, I really appreciated the decision science um, and uh, uh, th that, that thought process. And I think the more and more we can leverage research dollars for implementation science, so we are getting some stuff done and getting some, some programs launched on the ground while also conducting critical research that's needed because we, we do have to um, kind of like think critically and you know really reflect on like how, how did that project get executed? Was it effective? You know, and how are we measuring that? And how are we improving implementation in the future based on what the data told us and the research and analysis that we collected? Um, and then just some of the models that we hear, heard here tonight, I appreciate the FAIR model and I'm like, yeah, we should be like thinking about that when we're deploying um, projects in, in, um, in communities as well. And think also just in general, the, um, the network of weather stations and the potential that it's going to provide to do some more hyper, hyper local air quality monitoring um, and looking at specific types of either criteria air pollutants or hazardous air pollutants or other, um, other environmental exposures is gonna be really helpful and insightful. Um, I also, I think I mentioned this already, but I also really want to better understand the carbon sequestration possibility and potential. Um, I appreciated the question about like trees and, you know, kind of like digging deeper into that science. Like, why is this important? Because, um, you know, soil quality and nutrient flows are our critical question and our, our soil quality is, has been declining just like globally over um, several generations. And so how we ensure that we have healthy soils, um, whether or not that's looking at incorporating more um, um, soil amendments from biochar to compost, um, but also looking at things like mycelial communities and how that's impacting vegetation outcomes or how that can help uh, vegetation uh, survive or um, come back from uh, severe droughts that may also happen, or for that matter, um, to what extent does your soils like make communities more resilient when it comes to like capacity for the soils to hold moisture and water. So um, those are just some general thoughts and ideas based on what was shared. And um, we'll be finalizing the climate action plan at the end of this year. And so uh, really looking forward to sharing that. 
with um with, with anyone who's interested it'll, it'll be up and it, it'll be public and, uh we'll have some implementation uh events um early next year so yeah any try to take questions or yeah. All right. So I'll bet you look at the give under request. It's 8 30. Some people have already quietly left, understandable. So here's what we say. We're gonna do we're gonna do breakouts. If you if you cooked, understood, right? But what I'm gonna suggest is the breakout room is kind of the back where we just were, right? Yeah, there is 235 and 55 and Okay. I gave you all the wrong one. Well, we'll be standing over there and writing people in, right? And so, if you're willing to give it a few more minutes, then, then there will be three rooms, all right? Just put this. One will give you the option to follow up with Ava. And so, Ava and I, and some of the folks will be in there talking about these intersections with the climate action plan. And you know, we'll skip these, you know, 20 minutes and then we'll follow up on it. But just because it's follow up. Another one, um, Pete and other folks are going to be talking about measurement, measurement priorities, like what. From your perspective, if you're representing community or group, yeah. what measurements are you excited to be participating? What measurements can be taken? What you can hear today that you think that you want to learn more about? It, okay. And the third room, at least, I think, science and education. It's community science. Yeah, community science and education. I'm just looking for it's a time you helping you there, and then Mike's there. Mike, okay. Yeah. Um, and Lisa, there'll be a few people around. Um, they're going to be talking about, um, how do we connect with some of the things we heard today to potential for education programs that would be supported by these second communities, other kinds of outreach strategies, and again, like sitting with the our community science uh, moving forward, like what you want yourself and your community involved. And I know we're not going to accomplish all that before 9 p.m. today, but you know, walk over there, stretch your leg, you got energy at all, work one of those early, and like, thank the flag, some ideas. And, uh, <laughs> 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 